everybody. Welcome to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. It's Francis, and with me is uh, Ace Star Reporter with his uh, hat and his uh, little press uh, postcard on top of it. Ken Klippenstein. Ken, it's been a minute, man. How how have you been? Hey, I'm doing pretty well. Excited to do some uh, informing of the public, some journalism here. Yeah, uh, something that you're that, that you're that you're pretty good at, uh, as it turns out. I really. Uh, I, I, I enjoy the fact that I can read things that, uh, you know, we don't, you know, you don't see a whole lot of mainstream kind of stuff going on, uh, about and one of them. I, I wanted to bring you on to talk about a couple of things. Th- first thing that I do want to focus in on though, is, uh, a couple weeks back, Ron DeSantis decided, uh, that he just wasn't being enough of an ass clown and threw a bunch of migrants onto an airplane and sent them to Martha's Vineyard. And, uh, you know, the, the ensuing, like the, uh, the, the kind of surface level stuff that we saw the Martha's Vineyard, uh, you know, the community came out and supported them and got them, uh, the help and the, you know, got them to where they needed to go. It was all very nice and fluffy and whatever, but there's a lot like there, there's a lot of, of undertone that that's going on to this, you know, um, and, and your story really kind of dug into a lot of these things. So, um, I guess the, the first thing, um, is, what i mean other than obvi- the obvious answer is racism but what um is it that DeSantis saw here that you know he's seen uh some sort of opportunity for like what's his goals here uh well i'm speculating but i i imagine the response is what he wanted which was um you know outrage from anyone who's not um going to vote for the republicans and i think that that's probably gratifying to uh the base that he has to rely on and increasingly like peel off from from trump in order to um, win the presidential primary so you think that this is still all pushing towards a desantis presidential presidential primary oh yeah yeah so uh what so kind of let's go into some of the the detail about uh you know the 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 planning behind this so uh before we started recording you were mentioning that the person who uh who guided all these people onto this airplane was former U.S. intelligence, correct? Yeah, Army counterintelligence, and she left the army very recently. Any any indications of why this contract was up or something along those lines? We don't know yet. This is all happening very recently. And so, what was you know? I, I get what was the, um, the the tactics that she used to get these people onto this airplane? Well, according to their attorney, and and what the um, migrants, many of whom were um, Venezuelans. Um, and we're in state uh, being considered for um, asylum. So uh, a lot of the discourse around it was these illegals, so on and so forth. And it's like, actually not true. You're allowed to stay in country until um, there's a t- determination made as to um, the, the asylum request. Uh, but setting that aside for a moment, um, what they allege is that uh, they were given, and these, this was published in the news media. You can, you can look it up. Uh, brochures detailing um, that they were going to get job training. They were going to basically, you know, be able to enter American society if they, if they take this flight and go to this location where they were told that, um, you know, not only would they be given job training, but financial assistance and uh, a lot of material um, support benefits. Um, And, you know, none of that was true. And, uh, you know, when they arrived in Martha's Vineyard, they, were literally just left to fend for themselves and kind of wandered around like, well, we're, you know, we were told that we we're going to have a kind of process that we could go through and get acclimated. And that wasn't there. So thankfully, as you said, uh, people were able to take them in and help get them situated. But um, there was, they, they didn't know what to do when they touched down. It was just, there was, no, it, you know, the whole thing seemed to be a photo op because there was no, there was no actual procedure in terms of like how they were going to get them adjusted. And how, how exactly like they land, you know, you land in an airport, you don't know anybody there. You're just, you know, 50 ish migrants coming off of an airplane. How exactly did that end up turning into people? Like, how do people find out like, Oh, a bunch of migrants just got dropped off. Was there like an email that got sent out? Like how did the, the people of Martha's Vineyard find out about this? Oh, well um, the DeSantis administration very quickly started touting this and, you know, it just feels like sort of packaged um, to be this kind of like viral outrage bait sort of thing. And, you know, sort of trigger the liberals, get them upset, which, you know, I don't blame them for being upset about it. It is really horrifying what happened. But then also, um, you know, burnish his own, uh, you know, anti-immigration bona fides. And not just that, but but um, the particular uh, 
uh, presentation that the that the Trump has been so effective at 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 creating a base around, which is like this very media centric uh, spectacle of like outrage, uh, and so um, that that's how the public found out about it. You know, they weren't trying to hide it. They very they very quickly went public with it, and it was like a whole media release. Yeah, being very proud about uh, hey, look, we we did this to to stick it to the libs, and then the libs are like you know fine, cool, cool we'll take care of them. Uh, and which is also very strange because I don't believe Florida actually shares a border with uh, anybody other than other American states. So maybe it does. Does it touch? Does it touch Mexico a little bit? I can never remember. <laughs> no, Texas is too big. There's lo- there's all that Texas and Louisiana in the way. I guess they're they're not gonna. So where do, where do they? <laughs> where does DeSantis get get fifty Venezuelan refugees to do this with? Well, he used this individual, this former counterintelligence officer, to kind of round up people and and get them excited about you know, being able to get this job training and these, uh, benefits. And, um, you know, she herself was a Spanish speaker. I think, um, she's of Latino background. Um, and that was how they got them on. And, and then they released the statement. It was very unusual about it. Um, and we can talk about this more was that they didn't actually use, they, they have like ice or like, uh, they have plane, like ice has its own air division. And so sure. they have aircraft that they can that they routinely use for moving migrants around for different purposes. They didn't use that. They didn't go through the usual process. He contracted this out to a private um, company, um, who, to my astonishment, nobody had looked at the um, political donations to. And I very quickly found that there was a lot of like Florida GOP uh, donations, not not just to, for example, uh, Matt Gates, uh, but also Gates had acted as an attorney for this. Um, uh, airline company um for and, in 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 what like what did they do that they needed matt gates to be an attorney for <laughs> i don't know what the case was i just saw that um in the subsequent yeah. reporting yeah i mean it is normal for anybody to like a company to have lawyers um when they're matt gates though it, i i question what exactly your is like virtual systems is doing like you know the lolita ex- trying to bring the lolita express back or something for matt gates it's, it's like yeah yeah let's uh Landed on my forehead and we'll, we'll get going. Um, so yeah, the contracted for $615,000 just to fly, uh, to fly these guys on out there. So is it, um, is it political donations that this company has been making all over Florida and like been, have they been working closely with DeSantis or the Florida government in general? Is that something that you have come across? Yeah. What's interesting about it is it's not a huge company. It's not a corporation that is just making donations to everyone. Like I wasn't selective in what I looked at. It was literally just to Republican candidates, just to Florida Republicans. And a lot of the names were familiar. So uh, one of the people they donated to was um, the um, head of the Florida Appropriations Committee in the uh, state Congress, who himself created the program for the migrant uh, deportations and and provided the funding for it. Um, And so if you look at the donations that they went to, they're not small amounts, but they're also not huge amounts and they're not to very many people. It's maybe to like a dozen or so people. And it's just keeps being this circle of like Florida Republicans that it went to. And what's interesting about it is they didn't, they weren't even incorporated in Florida until very recently. Um, they uh, are based out of, um, I think it's Washington state um, near Seattle, if I remember right. And um, they, um, you know, operated out of that state until and, and they had a presence in florida for a number of years but they were always a foreign there was a foreign entity and it what they didn't actually become a florida company until like two years ago or so so all this is very recent how long has the company been around in general oh like over a decade like 15 oh, really? years the guy who owns it was himself a uh, former air force i believe and what's interesting about the company is when i started looking at um what their portfolio of, of work is they had received a large um contract from the defense department and so one of the things they do is they train um, Air Force pilots, um, in, not in routine stuff, but in kind of like special forces stuff more like um, they would train. One of the one of the big things that the website, which has now been taken down, um, advertised was that they would train them in uh, night vision situations. And it was a real, really a focus on like on like a special operations type of type of um, type of background. Which is, yeah, so, uh, and, and I'm seeing here, it also says that they uh, provide combat training to the U.S. Armed Forces, aircraft combat training. Um, 
I, I mean, is that dog fighting or something? What is that? I, or do you even like, it's, it's just very strange because I don't know what this company does still. Like there are, there are people with airplanes or are they people with airplane simulators? Uh, obviously they have one airplane that they, you know, flew a bunch of migrants to, to Martha's Vineyard. But if you're saying I'm going to provide, you know, aircraft combat training, I would imagine that you have something that can dogfight a little bit or I, or is this just, you know, a glorified uh, Microsoft flight simulator? We may never know. Uh, they took their website down. So how are we going to know? Yeah, from what I was able to surmise from somebody that had worked there, um, they did actually have some um, aircraft that they that they could uh, train the, the military pilots in. And, um, and what was interesting about it is that um, this person said they don't have civilian aircraft of the sort that you would use for moving people around or the sort that was actually used to move these migrants around. And so I asked, well, you know, who was the aircraft then? Cause there were photos of it. And this person who was a former air force officer and, you know, had some, had some um, contact with Vertal systems in the past said that they subcontracted it to another company, which itself handles um, uh, civilian aircraft. So they didn't have their own thing to do it. And then that raises the question of, well, then why go through that? <laughs> why right. not just hire the civilian aircraft company directly? Well, maybe they had, you know, they had them on speed dial because I do see that says, uh, um, you know, the Department of Transportation played paid Vertol nearly a million for too many, two more other projects related to relocating, relocation. So, uh, and and does I mean, as you said earlier, ICE has airplanes; they can do this themselves if they need to. Um, but you know, it seems strange that these people are going through a company that does not have airplanes that can do this. You know, like I, I order a lot of stuff, you know, from my store. And when I found out that I could delete the middleman and just talk to companies directly in Taiwan, it made things a lot easier for me. Don't really understand what this is going, you know, how this is going other than I understand how money laundering is done. So that's what it really feels like is just a whole lot of like, what if we just dumped a shitload of money into here and it came out all clean and um and racist on the other side this was astonishing to me is that it, so if it's that they have done a terrible job of hiding it like it took me like 10 minutes of going through campaign finance records to immediately find all of these like uh uh florida republican connections to the company but doesn't matter like you've done some great reporting you've got a lot of great information is anything going to happen to Vertol? they they shut down their, they're going to, I mean, at, at the worst, they're, what's going to happen is they're going to pull a black water and they're just going to rename themselves and pop up again and say, look, now we, now we do have like a, uh, they're going to get like a couple of decommissioned supermax, uh, 747 supermaxes and uh, hope they don't slam them into the ground or something. I mean, I think you're right. Like nothing's going to happen, you know, criminally, but um, in the context of a, um, you know, a presidential primary, uh, you know, if people if the Democrats end up conducting investigation as the state Democrats um, have suggested they want to do, you know, this could end up generating, uh, I mean, who knows how far something like this goes in terms of uh, the political connections and, and, and what sort of uh, fodder you can make of that. But yeah, I, I generally agree. Um, I've, I've, <laughs> one can never go wrong uh, betting on nothing happening. Yeah. Um, it seems to be the, the thing that that's always a sure bet in America is uh, some rich guy is going to get away with it. <laughs> Yeah. After a very protracted, um, uh, you know, uh, inquiry that finds so much detail, <laughs> we're just sitting there just mind boggling. Yeah, one guy, one guy doing some Googling. It's like, oh, shit, you guys are uh, breaking the law. This was so crazy. Yeah. Like, I'd like to be this great gumshoe reporter. But the truth is, finding this stuff took me like 15 minutes. It didn't take any work. It's just no one had done it. Yeah, and it's knowing where to go. I wouldn't know where to to look for. These oh, that's things, true. But yeah, yeah. You see, you you've. I mean, that's why you're the king, the FOIA king. You know, uh, you you know where to go to uh, extract this information. Now we're not going to do anything with the information other than <laughs> quote tweet and uh, be really mad <laughs> online. But we do have the information at least, so that <laughs> later on, like you know, in sixty to seventy years, when our grandchildren are reading about you know these times, much like when we read about Nazi Germany, and you're just like. It was all there. Why did they let it happen? I don't know. We were too busy posting. I don't know. I don't know what everybody else's excuses were, but uh, I had I had to post the pig pooping on its own balls again. So I got. I love sorry. the I love the, I love the high flutin expressions they have to rationalize the inaction. It's I'm bearing witness. I'm bearing, I, I, I'm bearing witness to the struggle. Doesn't that mean something? It's like no, it doesn't. If it doesn't lead to anything, <laughs> posting is. Posting is not praxis, except for when it is. But uh, when 
when you're when you're bearing witness, you're just like uh, it. It just that always just feels like I need to uh, I, I need to flog myself. Like when when the Ukraine oh, totally. or when the Ukraine war started up, and people are like, I watch every video that I can watch about combat in Ukraine because obviously I combat veteran these things are interesting watching you know how the russians suck and how good the ukrainians are and you know learning about how things are changing and the escape war escapes and everything and then you have like somebody who's just like i have to watch all these like massacre videos uh to uh to bear witness like back in my day ken we were just watching beheading uh videos because we were fucked up in the head we were honest about it at least No, you got to raise, you got to raise awareness. That's the other one. My, my other yeah, I, by once again, by posting online, uh, that's why I have a podcast. Uh, this is, this is the closest to praxis as I get that and donating money sometimes. Uh, that's, that's about as uh, close as I get to it. All right. So, um, what's, what's the future plans here? Like is Santa's going to keep, I, we, he's, he got away with it once. Is there going to, you know, I, I feel like if this was more, um, I don't know how to say it, but successful in the eyes of DeSantis, uh, we would be seeing more of this. We'd be seeing more of uh, Greg Abbott doing something like this, you know, dropping him off in Providence, Rhode, Rhode Island or something, which I, I don't know, maybe that, you know, hey, it's that, let's let's spread him around. You know, uh, St. Louis is home to 60,000 Bosnians. Let's, you know, start bringing some more people back in. What What is the plan going forward? Well, what's interesting, as you said before, there are two more contracts listed um, I think with that with that company for migrant deportation and the other two cases, I think uh, one of them was supposed to happen and hasn't yet. It's kind of interesting because they sort of distanced themselves from it. Maybe they'll end up um, still doing it. They were going to ship people. I think the contract one of them was for moving someone to Delaware, which of course is where the president President Biden is is from. So I think it's supposed to. I think the idea might be um, drop, drop oh, we're going to own uh, them, but yeah, we're, we're going to right. Yeah, they're going to send him to uh, to Biden's house, and the dog's going to attack him. Yeah, uh, but I wonder I, if he got. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. I hope the dog's it's doing major. Okay. Yeah, after after biting like multiple Secret Service agents, um, you know the 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 best dog ever to be in the White House, um, in my <laughs> opinion. Um, what it, it what's interesting? I think he might have bitten off more than he could chew because, um, not just. I mean, I think the public outrage that must have been anticipated and part of the deal. But um, one feature of it that I don't think they expected was that um, a, a, a Texas sheriff opened a criminal investigation into it because um, actually these migrants weren't even in Florida. They were moved, I believe, from Texas to Florida to um, Martha's Vineyard. And so um, in the context, uh, there's some federal law that prohibits you from um, doing that It from another state. It's sort of complicated to get in a legalese but um it, the fact that a texas sheriff opened a criminal investigation i can't imagine that's something that they're uh, either anticipated or are excited about so i guess we'll see yeah it sounds like it's just dicked up on all kinds of levels all right again let's uh let's let's shift focus a little bit um i want to talk uh we're going to move away from military stuff i want to talk about inflation because um i don't really understand a whole lot of uh some of the stuff that's been coming out about inflation like i understand You've got this article, um, Iron Mountain, this data you know, CEO of Iron Mountain, which is very funny because I used to sh- I used to be in a building with Aaron, uh, Iron Mountain once upon a time when I had to go into an office. But the CEO saying that inflation is great for the bottom line, I understand where that comes from. But I do also remember uh, a lot of reporting about saying that we have to like raise the unemployment level to lower inflation. Um, what fucked up math is that, Ken? Yeah, so um, you know, I got into this subject of reporting just by reading the like uh, corporate earnings calls, which is what that story you just mentioned was based on. Because these CEOs and um, senior executives of these companies are extraordinarily candid in these calls, because nobody reads them outside of the investor community. And in addition to that, um, you know, legally they can't lie to um, investors, uh, so there's a level of um, you know candor and honesty that there isn't in politics at all. Yeah, you can't lie, but you also can shut your fucking mouth sometimes. Uh, but right. I guess, as you said, they're they're just not they're not. No used one's to looking anything. at them. Yeah, nobody. Yeah. They, and this is why you always need reporters that are at the school board meetings uh, reading all the minutes. Except yours is uh, CEOs of uh, data companies. Yeah, he basically conveyed what I think a lot of corporate executives think, and maybe they're sophisticated enough to know um, not to say it. 
but um, you know, there's the inflation rate, which it doesn't mean the value of the dollar. It means um, like what the costs of different indices are for things that like consumers buy. So it's like um, when you come up with the inflation rate, it's not like what the value of the dollar is. It's like how much of different things, you know, maybe it's uh, bread and milk and fish and, and, you know, housing equipment, whatever. And then they come up with this number to give you a sense of how it's increased. What that doesn't tell you is how much um, those prices have increased as a consequence of the actual costs increasing associated with the production of those goods versus just corporations taking advantage of uh, whatever the uh, economic environment is and jacking them up just to make more profit. And often those two go together. So if input costs rise, and of course, you know, they have to um, increase the, the price of the goods to continue to make profit. But at the same time, they can try to sneak in an increase that isn't really warranted, but just because they can say, hey, look, everything's going up. We had to do it. What do you want from us? Yeah. Infl- things are costing 10% more, so we had to raise our prices 20%. Exactly. And there's no honesty in terms of the discussion of, like, obviously, um, you know, just going through, I went through hundreds of these investor calls. And it's very clear that there's two main causes of the inflation. One is the sanctions on Russia for the invasion of Ukraine, which uh, causes a whole lot of oil since they're the second biggest OPEC um, producer um, to come off the market and just making oil really expensive and oil factors into the cost of everything since that's what we use to you know manufacture things, move things around. Um, and then the second one is supply chain problems. Um, a lot of that coming from uh, China's really aggressive um, COVID uh, uh, mandates that make it so that you know entire factories are shutting down and that, that gums up supply uh, chains. So it's mostly those two things. And uh, what's interesting is if you look at the kind of mainstream discourse around this, it said that, oh, um, you know, the employment market is too tight. They use these wonderful euphemisms that uh, when you interrogate what they mean, it's kind of a polite way of saying, you'll see that everywhere from Larry Summers to former, um, uh, you know, big economic guy under uh, Obama to, to, you know, Jamie Dimon, so on and so forth. What that means is um, workers uh, have it too good. It just means that they um, are in a situation where employers are having problems filling jobs. And the obvious solution to that is like offer more attractive jobs and then you won't have that problem because there are plenty of people that want to work. They're just not willing to work at the terms that a lot of these businesses want. And so um, they attribute a lot of the attributing of like what's causing inflation is saying that it's these workers are too pampered and think their situation is too nice. But the, the labor market is too tight. If we loosen the labor market, which is a euphemism for just make things worse for them so that they're more desperate and that they're willing to take whatever job there is, then that'll fight inflation. But inside the corporate calls with investors, that's not what they're saying at all. They know that that's not what's driving the inflation. They know that it's overwhelmingly those two other features I was telling you about um, before. So that disjunct between what you see in um, CNBC and cable uh, business discussion versus just what the CEOs are actually saying among themselves is, is a night and day difference. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing just the, uh, the argument that's in here, it says inflation historically had an inverse relationship with employment. Um, when inflation rises, unemployment drops. Uh, higher unemployment leads to um, low in- lower inflation. It says when more people are working, they have the power to spend, which leads to an increase in demand, which still doesn't make sense. Uh, unless, like, like, it does, I'm sure it contributes to inflation a little, but it's like pales in comparison to the right. to the Russia oil and the supply chain problems. Sure. And also just CEO saying, well, fuck it. You know, everything went up 10%. We're going to go up 20%. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And this is, and, and a lot of this, it always seemed like the, uh, forcing, I don't even know how you force unemployment up other than giving, cause like all these companies everywhere I go still, there's still, we're hiring, fill out an application, you know, uh, McDonald's is offering, you know, $17 an hour uh, for managers. There's a lot of like really great opportunities out there for people to work. But if people, if we boost unemployment back up to 5%, our labor market's going to get even worse than it currently is because, you know, we're still losing 3,000 people a week to to COVID and we lost a million people to COVID, a million plus, really. You know, the official numbers uh, are a million. I'm sure it's much higher than that. So it just doesn't really make sense that at the end of the day, the idea is we need more people out of the labor market and more of these companies to struggle and, uh, and, and you know, for it to suck because... I I remember look look I've gone to um you know a few McDonald's when there were some uh um 
you know, there's only two people working and it sucks. It sucks for them. I hate it for them. I hate that during the lunch, but usually people are pretty, you know, they're like, okay, we're, we under, we're understanding, but like to say that, that, that the situation out here needs to get worse, not only for the worker, but the consumers too, for inflation to go down is just like, look guys, everything is too nice for you and you're going to need to suck some shit for th- for me to, to have a better, uh, a, a better day. And really, that's what's what it seems like coming down. Yeah, to. and what's extraordinary, like I, I guess there there could be a situation in which you know inflation uh, maybe is driven so much by labor concerns that that's something you have to look at. But first of all, like let's be honest, things are better than they've been for labor. Um, but that's a relative sure. thing. Like it's not <laughs> better it compared mean to it's how right. bad it's always been. Yeah, and then the other the other factor in all this is that corporations are literally making more profit than they've made in like 80 years they're they are smashing all the records for corporate profit so the thing is if the costs are just so high and there's nothing we can do about it then why are they making money hand over fist you think that would be reflected in their earnings and that they'd make more modest earnings but the fact that they're swimming in money and at the same time saying oh you know no one wants to take our jobs well the obvious solution is you know put some of that money into making the jobs more attractive and you won't have that problem but they don't seem willing to do that and so um, you know, the, the kind of economic establishment seems to be turning to, okay, you know, corporations aren't going to, um, you know, just make jobs more attractive to solve this. So here's another way we could do it. We could just smash employment, bring up unemployment, and then people will get desperate enough that they'll start taking and filling those jobs. And I, I mean, I think that would probably work in terms of getting people to take the jobs, but the, the, the medicine is worse than the disease then. <laughs> You know? Right, and then again, you're you're boosting your uh, you're you're lowering lowering unemployment, so everybody's going to start going back to uh, well, we've got to, you know, go back. We're, we're going to have inflation again, and of course, you know, the big thing is things are so nice, and that's why the military is having such a problem uh, with you know maintaining or recruiting people. I mean, yes, also uh, we did recently get out of a really long, stupid war that nobody should have gone to, so. Uh, it's very understanding that Gen Z is saying, uh, no, thank you. I don't want to do that again. Um, but at the same time, you know, people join the military during bad, ec- bad economics because the military is a place where you get a paycheck um, every two weeks. It, it always shows up, uh, barring government shutdowns, but you always get your back pay. Uh, you get 30 days paid vacation from day one. You know, it's a great it's a great deal. Um, there's sometimes you got to go do a war. Um, Sometimes maybe that war is not justified, but it's a good. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up the military parallel because we've had a number of Republican politicians just publicly say, um, you know, recruitment is suffering because the employment market is good. We have to do something about that. Have you seen these statements where they say we need to have student debt to, like, or else we're not going to be able to recruit any kids? They just openly say it, which is shocking to me. Right, and and it's very easy, you know, just like any anything, uh, any other time that somebody starts saying, "Well, you look at America and you see how things are here, and we have to make these changes. We have to make things worse so that we can have more people in the military." And then you look at like literally any other country, um, it's like Germany. I don't think is having a military recruitment problem. Maybe if the United States did not feel the need to project power to half of the countries in uh, in the known world. Maybe we wouldn't need so many troops, but again, you know, we're we're no longer um, we're we're no longer sending people out. We're not really doing massive deployments, so we don't really need the numbers. I would think, but I'm not in charge of those budgets, unfortunately. Um, every time, every time uh, people complain about the runaway military budget, while I was actually in the reserves, there was a lot of us saying like, okay. Yes, we did just get seven hundred and fifty billion dollars. But when I say us, I don't mean this army unit. You do not. We do not have money to send you to sergeant school. Are you Are you telling me that the people that work in the Amazon fulfillment centers don't have the same interests as Jeff Bezos? It's crazy. Uh, you know, and and that's always been you know it, uh, you know much much like as, as you were talking about making the lives better for the workers always seems to you know make it makes everybody happy. It makes you it makes a happier worker that stays around longer. My my regular nine to five job is great. I love it. I love the people I work with. I love the management team. Um, you know, it's it's great, and everybody should uh, should have. You know, something like that. And if somebody came to me and was like, hey, we'll give you like a $15,000 raise if you start coming into this office and tell them no. Why well, I'm loyal. I got a nice job. I got a nice gig. I stay at home. It's fantastic. I love it. Um, the military is the same way. You know, you got to make a environment that people want to stay in. And when your environment is 
which is garbage, uh, nobody's nobody's going to stick around. So yeah, that's a really good point. I interviewed a um, economist, J. W. Mason, who said that um, just looking at the tight labor market and and saying, "Oh, it's tighter than it was before," therefore that's a problem. It, it sort of assumes that it was good before. So he made a very interesting point. He said that um, if the labor market remains tight, that's going to incentivize business to make to to focus on retention as opposed to the insane churn and burn economy that we have, where no one's expected to last somewhere more than a couple of years and then move on to the next thing. He says, you know, yes, things are tighter, but it's like th- like that's not necessarily a bad thing. That means then they ha- actually have to worry about keeping someone around for a while. And like, is it the worst thing that businesses have to actually think about these questions of how do we get people instead of just being able to count on uh, people's desperation, driving them to take whatever. And I, th- I think he's right. I mean, I think it's just so foreign to, to the way our economic system has been structured throughout, you know, all of my life um, that, that, that workers would ever have any kind of small amount of leverage that people are looking at and thinking, wow, this is really strange. We've never seen this before. It must be bad, but I don't think it necessarily is bad. Yeah. It, it always, it also always seems that like CEOs and management have this like allergic reaction to, you know, spending, just giving somebody money. Like when, when somebody says, you know, oh, uh, you just want to let people out of prison and give them free money to live somewhere. It's like per person, you know, to be incarcerated is like a hundred thousand dollars. Like financially, it makes more sense to say, Hey, instead of prison, why don't we do something where we give you housing and a job? And, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm not giving you every idea, but I am just saying that a hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money to keep somebody incarcerated in prison for various reasons, you know, violent offenders. Sure. But drug dealers, come on guys, give them something a little bit better. And the same thing comes with, you know, uh, with what, you know, companies are going to do with this money. You know, it's like you could, you know, like, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to dump a bunch of money into making a really great break room for you guys. Like, cool. You're just trying to incentivize me to stay here more often. Like if you just gave me more, if you took that million dollars, you're going to do, do that with, and you went to like your 50 employees and you said, Hey, we're just going to like disperse this million dollars among the rest, among you guys. Is everybody happy? They're all going to give you a thumbs up because that's a really good bonus. So, you know, it's it, the the direct money to somebody is just like, and you know, I'm sure it all comes back to our weird American Protestant work ethic of you know nobody gets nobody gets a dollar if they don't earn it. Which you know, I think that living in America itself is a full time job, so you might as well get paid for it. Yeah, it's an interesting point, and um, what this reminds me of is. Uh, there's always this assumption that, that, you know, businesses are profit seeking and everything. And it's, there's like, obviously that's a huge component of it, but there are other considerations too. There are power considerations. Um, you know, if they, even if giving workers more resources and giving them a better situation is rational in terms of, you know, productivity and profit, um, that, that there are questions of um, power that, that, that I think often take precedence over concerns about that. So for example, when the Federal Reserve is increasing interest rates, which is known to have the effect of causing recessions, causing unemployment to rise, um, you know, you might look at that and say, oh, it's actually hurting their bottom line because look at the stock market. It's suffering. It's going to create problems. From- that's true, but that's not their only concern in life. Um, another story that I did uh, looking at an earnings call had a CEO say, um, you know, there are problems associated with recession that would hurt us, but it would be good in the sense that it would put, quote, um, employers back in the driver's seat. Uh, and an example he gave for that was, you know, people are people are so uppity now, but wanting remote work after COVID and realizing you can mostly do your job remotely. Why do I need to come in every day? Things like he says, things like that would would no longer would cease to be a problem if you have a situation where unemployment rises because things would be precarious enough that they wouldn't feel comfortable asking for these kind of concessions. So it would put the employers back in the driver's seat. And so these questions of power, I think, um, often take precedence over uh, over short term profit in a way that I don't think is 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 widely appreciated it does and and, you know once again financially i could tell you that like you know if you don't have people coming into the office you don't have to pay for an office you are you know spend more money on your it infrastructure you will you will save money this way but again like you said it's a power dynamic it's a i want i want it like i had to go into my office yesterday to uh to work on some stuff it's fine you know most people are still working from home and i know that my company is cool with that they're they would rather people work from home because it is easier to uh to handle something like that it's less expensive so it just you know it 
it never it never makes sense other than you maybe have a manager that wants to make sure that they can look over your shoulder and make sure that you're not dicking around on Twitter like I do all day. Um, but also, I get all of my work done. So, and I'm good at what I do. And those are the real metrics that somebody should uh, should be you know, going off of. Which, of course, we know they don't. It's all about it's all about power and uh, and making sure that that you, the worker, uh, know where you stand, and that's uh, you don't stand at all. All right. So, so Ken, I think we've covered some good things here. Now, I want to uh, to bring something else up. Um, in my, I was you know grabbing some articles for us to read. So, uh, you know, the easiest way for me to do that is to Google your name. And I found out that you have a Wikipedia. Um, now my favorite part of a Wikipedia is the controversies area, which you seem to have, uh, Ken, who wrote this Wikipedia? I don't know. You have three controversies listed. So, uh, have you, have you read your controversies? Yes. Uh, And I could say if I wrote it, which I assume (laughs) people would believe, um, I wouldn't have put the controversies in because I have a lot of conservative sources in the national security world that I don't want to see that part of the controversy section. Well, I'm going to uh, see. And here's the thing, though, like, is that when when you Google somebody and you like any uh, per, like, uh, actor, politician or whatever, you get to the controversies part. It's always horrifying. Right. <laughs> it's always just like this person uh, just like controversies, this person, you know, uh trafficked children or this person stole money from like uh from veterans organizations or something it's like it's always and it's always it shouldn't be controversies it should say this guy sucks shit yeah um but but your controversies are great so i want to go through these controversies i want to give you a chance to uh to to air out uh (laughs) what's going on here so that you can give uh proper responses to the public here so let's do it my first one, Klippenstein has occasionally been the subject of reporting himself due to pranking individuals from across the political spectrum. Following a Twitter flame war with Tesla CEO Elon Musk, he attracted Musk's attention by sharing a Vogue uh, photo from 2014 Vanity Fair Oscar after party, showing Musk with, uh, I can't, how do you say her first name? Ghislaine. Ghislaine Maxwell, a longtime associate of the late convicted sex offender Jer- Jeffrey Epstein, who has been convicted of sex trafficking. Musk, who as of June 3rd, 2020, had 35.5 million Twitter followers, publicly posted that Klippenstein was a, quote, douche about town, town end quote. Um, reactions, Ken? Uh, game recognized game? <laughs> a douche about town. Um, it, it's, I, I, I'm glad that I get to read this because also which came, what came across uh, my Twitter feed today is that... Uh, Musk has to go forward with buying Twitter. So uh, he's going to come for you, uh, Ken. He's going to show. My days are numbered. Yeah. Yeah. All of our days are numbered. Um, He's (laughs) anybody who posts uh, the Ghislaine Maxwell photo is going to get a perma band. A multi multi billionaire who, who um, tries to keep his car, his auto manufacturing company open uh, in the worst part of COVID. Is there any, do we, do we need to be afraid of him being vindictive? Uh, no, I mean, I think that we should praise him for creating cars that apparently are boats now too. Um, which he said about the cyber truck, uh, a, a vehicle that we have not actually seen anywhere other than in pictures and on a uh, stage somewhere. So I don't know. He, he also gave us a robot recently that, uh, you know, oh, yeah. What was that? I, it was like, th- they tried to do the big media push, but it just fell flat. It didn't uh, work. Do you remember the last time he debuted a robot and it was just a guy in a robot suit? <laughs> Just like you're dressed up for Halloween in a, in a mech suit, but it's right. like Not it's like that. cardboard boxes. Yeah, it was it was this like, hey, why don't you put on like this uh, this white leotard that we designed <laughs> off of like the Institute from Fallout Four, and then uh, <laughs> somebody dug up like an old Daft Punk helmet and like put it on. It's like don't flip the switch on so it gives you the hearts and stuff. Just wear it and do like walk up these stairs slowly. And so they gave us a real robot and everybody, the thing is, is that nobody's impressed because like DARPA has already put machine guns on little robot dogs. And that's what we're concerned about more than. Yeah, that's exactly it. Cause I think everyone's seen the MIT robots that can like walk through doors and stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of funny. This would have been impressive. If he had just done it like 10 years prior. <laughs> it, it wouldn't have been because he debuted a robot. That's like no better than any other robot that we've ever seen. Like, <laughs> yeah. and I don't mean like in the last like five years, I mean, seriously, this is, this is some, you know, 1980s robot shit that we see here. It's like, I can walk forward slowly and turn my head left and right. 
Um, it was what is pretty- the use case? How is he pitching it? Like, what? Why are you supposed to w- want to buy one? Apparently, this slow ass thing is supposed to help me in my uh, my day to day chores. Um, so <laughs> maybe maybe it can post for me. I don't know. All right, Ken. Let's uh, let's address number two. July 2019, Kleppenstein was covered by uh, in the media after a Twitter incident in which he was <laughs> retweeted by Iowa Congressman Steve King just before a change in his display name to Steve King is a white supremacist. Uh, in March 2021, Klippenstein pranked author Naomi Wolf by recommending she tweet an image of a fabricated anti-vaxxer quotation paired with a picture of American pornography actor Johnny Sins. Now, Ken, when I read this for the first time, I had that feeling of archaeologists who are translating, you know, like using the Rosetta Stone and translating something because um Pranked author Naomi Wolf by recommending she retweet an image of fa- fabricated anti-vaxxer quotation paired with a picture of American pornography actor Johnny Sins is all correct. There is no factual incorrectness there. But man, you're really going to miss out on not knowing how much we love posting Johnny Sins in his uh, police <laughs> and military uniform. Yeah, totally. I if stand on the not, shoulders of giants. You know... um, I should try to get Johnny Sins on the show. I wonder if he's still around. He retweeted it when that oh, happened. Hey. So he must be down. Yeah. So if you're not aware, Johnny Sins, uh, American pornography actor uh, who loves to be, there's this great photo of him in like an old BDU military uniform, staring off into the middle <laughs> distance with his hand on his collar. Like he's about to rip it off. Like he's at a Chippendales concert and just, you know, I, I and again, this is like reading reading hieroglyphs. I'm reading ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Like you're really not going to get it unless you understand just how fantastic of an own that is. Um, and and to, to to continue on, we'll go on to number three, which is one of my favorite things. I love that every year this works somehow with somebody else. It's always fantastic. Increasingly famous, and to the point that it's making me a little uncomfortable. Who is it? It worked with the former chief, intelligence chief of the United States. It's just right, like, okay. how far is this going to go? Yeah, Memorial Day 2021, Klippenstein trick political commenters uh, Dinesh D'Souza and Matt Schlapp, as well as Florida Congressman Matt Gates, into retweeting a photo of Lee Harvey Oswald, John F. Kennedy's assassin, whom Klippenstein claimed was his veteran grandfather. After being retweeted by Gates, Klippenstein changed his display name to be Matt Gates is a pedo, and Gates later deleted his retweet. Um, I, 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 as, as we said, this continues to happen. Uh, and I don't see here. Here's what I'm, I'm wondering. Um, Matt Gates is about our age. I met, I think he's, I think he's like in his late thirties. So he's, he's close to my age. Um, and, and I don't know, maybe do, do people, I like, I know all the people who listen to this know who Lee Harvey Oswald is because we're all just very politically connected and extremely online. But like, I'm just wondering if he's got like a 21 year old intern who's just like, yeah, I should retweet these things without like question it because it's they, they've done it with uh, Lee Harvey. Uh, they've done it with, um, wasn't the, the Unabomber, uh, Ted Kaczynski in the military. I didn't see that. No, I didn't I, see that. I can't remember. Like, I've seen it with that. I've seen it with uh, Chris Dorner. Um, you know who oh yeah like in the last decade killed a bunch of cops i think um it consistently works so uh i and and i am i am a huge fan of constantly doing this uh of 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 say because you know it's it's always performative obviously most of these people don't give a shit about the military if you just look at their that's exactly it is it's not so much that they are um gullible is that they are desperate to project an image of that they care about the military. And that's why it works, because they're desperately trolling Twitter for an opportunity to look like they give a shit about the the um, armed services uh, folks. And and it's so telling. They're, it's, like a, it's almost like projection. They're showing that they know how deficient they are in that, and they have to compensate by posting about these things. That's why they fall for it. Yeah, and I, and I wonder how much longer this is going to work. Because they're they're now that we're no longer engaged in you know a a, a long term you know military uh, campaign as we were in Afghanistan, you know obviously the military because we're all you know the army's all woke now by saying that you shouldn't sexually harass women um, and 
you should get your vaccines that you've been getting for the last you know decade that you've been in. So we're all woke now, and I don't think that they, uh, you know, I'm I'm not too sure if they're going to continue on with how great the military is, uh, unless unless they get really into it. Just like yeah, I really do love. Actually, I love Lee Harvey Oswald. I think he should have shot more presidents. Nobody take that out of out of context here and post it somewhere. <laughs> Um, yeah, I try, I try, when I do these things, I try not to cheap shot people in the sense that I try to make it something that is really easy to tell what's going on. Like, I'm not going to pick some obscure person that, that, you know, like only, a only, only real heads know. Like I'm trying to make it like, and especially I, th- th- I try to make the, the punishment fit the crime in the sense of, I try to find these people that wrap themselves in the flag and are always talking about how they understand real America and I'm an actual American and then give them these examples. Like, so you said Lee Harvey Oswald or. Or um, another one I did was um, that iconic scene in A Few Good Men where it's um, Jack Nicholson saying, um, you can't handle the truth. I try to pick these things that are supposed to be um, something that someone who says, like, you know, I'm as American as apple pie would, would understand and recognize. And it's just they whiff every time. I can't. It's it's unbelievable. Every, I'm, I'm surprised every time when it happens. Look, Ken, um, Lee Harvey Oswald spoke truth to power with um, an Italian Carino. Um <laughs> Nobody, nobody take that out of context either, please. Uh, Ken, I, I appreciate you you coming clean about these controversies, uh, these controversies of uh, how much you have They've owned. dogged me for years, but yeah. um, you... Con- controversially uh, owned people online. Uh, this was like Frost Nixon, where you got me to... to- issue a mea culpa and yeah and i'm gonna start I'm, I'm gonna pay closer attention to your twitter feed so i can add to the controversies part <laughs> here i can you know just keep adding on to it just the the crimes of ken klippenstein uh he made sarah palin uh retweet ted kaczynski or something i've got to gotta go on the list now well ken i appreciate you coming on man i love uh i love talking about this stuff i want to bring you on more often to uh to talk about your your reporting your writing and all the things that you come across uh and you know uh if you have anything uh, for, for Ken, Ken, how can people contact you? Uh, yeah. If you work for the federal government, military, whatever, um, I cover a lot of national security stuff. You can reach me on signal at two zero two five one zero twelve sixty eight. Yep. And, uh, well, you can also find Ken on Twitter at Ken, Ken Klippenstein. Uh, <laughs> I'm always I'm I'm always uh, uh, tempted to do the like the Berenstein and Berenstain. Is it Clint, Ken Klippenstein? Yeah, it's not Ken Klippenstein. Uh, Ken Klippenstein on Twitter. Follow him. Uh, if when when he's not dropping great uh, reporting like this, he is uh, owning the conservatives online, which is also a great time. Ken, thank you so much for coming on. Everybody else, we'll talk to you next week. Zoom, zoom, zoom.